thanks a lot. Um, the way this, uh, just wanted to give you a little uh, uh, explanation about how this came about. Um, a couple of years ago, I was driving back from the Mothman Festival and Rosemary contacted me, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and uh, she was, uh, at that time she was doing her, her radio show uh, called Strange Dimensions, and she asked me to be on it, which was uh, quite a thrill really to be asked by Rosemary to be on her show. We had a great time. We, uh, uh, I talked a lot about the very things that Joey and I are writing about in this book. And at one point she said, uh, you know, you're going to have to write a book because nobody else is writing about this stuff. And I will publish it. And I thought, wow. She, uh, of course, was the head of uh, VisionaryLiving.com. And for about a year, I, I you know, tried to work on outlines, couldn't really figure out how to present the material. And then fortunately, Joey Medea, and I've known Joey and Tanya for about a, about a decade, uh, started to come up with some ideas of how we could present the material. And of course, Joey is an experienced author and, and published and uh, has uh, uh, many uh, books published. So it was, a, uh, it was great for me to, uh, to have Joey uh, as a writing partner to make this a reality. Now, uh, when we talk about parallels and patterns, we're, we're talking about past and present, elements of folklore and modern day UFO experiences. We're also talking about what we think of as different types of paranormal phenomena, uh, cryptids, UFOs, ghostly phenomena, paranormal phenomena, all seeming to have underlying patterns if we listen to the reports and what people are experiencing. Um, one of the most classic examples, that I, one of the, the best examples that I love is the case of the cosmic pancakes from outer space. Joe Symington, 1961, Eagle River, Wisconsin. He, uh, uh, all kinds of different things come into this one experience. He was uh, in his house, he hears this, uh, it's late morning, hears this really, really strange noise, goes outside, and he sees a, a classic uh, flying saucer hovering just off the ground. Now, he goes outside and approaches. He, uh, you can see that the door is open. He sees people in there that look pretty normal. Uh, he, uh, well, it's a very strange situation. He doesn't seem to be, he's not threatened by it. As he approaches, he sees uh, 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 some men that look like, well, they're in coveralls or wearing some kind of a skull cap. They're maybe about five feet tall. And as he approaches, one of the men hand, handles, hands him a sort of a, a chrome-colored bucket or, or, or chalice or whatever you want to call it. And he says it's the same color as the craft they were in. Now, there's no telepathy or, or verbal communication, but he indicates that he wants water. And now Joe is looking behind this guy, and he sees another one of his crew member. It looks like he's cooking pancakes on a flameless grill. Okay, this is a, a supposedly some kind of an extraterrestrial craft, and the, the whole thing is kind of absurd. We'll deal with that in a moment. So Joe retrieves the water. He has a hard time, he says, looking directly at this guy. He's a little bit uncomfortable. But he, he hands him the water, and in return, they give him three pancakes, and then they take off. The whole incident only lasts about uh, five or 10 minutes. Now the thing is, Project Blue Book, and we know that the TV show has been out now, um, and, uh, and dealing with the, the character, the real person of Dr. Heinrich, but not in a terribly good way, at least the TV show. Um, the thing is about Joe's story, the Air Force comes down, they investigate, uh, there's a local judge there that's a friend of his, everybody believes that Joe believes he had a real experience. And you can even see Joe on, on some, with some of his, uh, uh, on YouTube, where he talks about some of his, some of his experiences. Now, uh, so the judge, Judge Carter, interviews him, and he, uh, well, he believes Joe, and he believes Joe had some kind of experience. He's a little tongue-in-cheek when he starts out. He says, hey, Joe, what do these guys look like? Little green men? And Joe says, no, Judge, they were kind of swarthy looking, like Italians. Now, I don't think uh, the Italians had a secret space program, but they may have. So, now also, the, uh, again, the absurdity of it, a, a extraterrestrial craft coming down needs an external source of water. I hate to think what their plumbing system is doing at that moment. Um, now the, uh, the Air Force sent the pancakes, used taxpayers' money to send it to the Food and Drug Lab uh, of the Department of Health and Welfare. 
to examine them and the, the, uh, the results in a moment. We have to segue to uh, Evans Walter Wentz right now. He wrote a book in 1911 called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. And uh, he interviewed people in Ireland about their experiences with the, the fairies, the elementals and so forth. Now, when we talk about fairies, we're not talking about benign little tinkerbells that would uh, do good deeds. The fairies were actually feared. People believed in them wholeheartedly, and there was both sort of a negative and positive aspect of them. Um, Jacques Vallée, who wrote Passport to Magonia, who talks a lot about the UFO fairy connection, he quotes Wentz. Uh, Wentz talked to a, an Irishman that said, the fairies uh, eat fresh meat, they drink pure water, and they never take salt. Guess what was the missing ingredient in the, in the pancakes from outer space? There was no sodium. But again, look at the absurdity of the situation. If this was in, in modern day, we tend to think, well, maybe if it's a real experience, if it really happened, it's got to be ET somehow. 100 or 200 years ago, it would have been the fairies, even though they showed up in a metallic chariot of some kind. There are many, many parallels between uh, various traditions of folklore and modern day UFO experiences. The missing time aspect, what that we're very familiar with, also happened when, with encounters with the fairies. Uh, you weren't necessarily uh, destined for a, an unscheduled medical exam with no deductible and no copay, but you might be whisked away to a, an, uh, an underground kingdom or inside a mountain. Oftentimes, UFO abductees believe they were taken underground to a UFO base. There's many parallels, uh, something they call elf disease. Some people that have been, been in proximity to humanoids, like in Ireland, or rather Wales in 1977, developed a strange dermatological condition. Uh, that also helped happen in close proximity to the uh, elementals. Now the water aspect is kind of interesting because there's many, many traditions of water being collected by uh, unidentified craft. Uh, Ingo Swan uh, said he, uh, Ingo Swan, the guy that helped develop the remote viewing program, said he saw a triangular craft suck water up from a lake out in the middle of nowhere at one time. Um, uh, there was a, a, a classic case in Ontario, Canada, where a couple saw a craft land, they put a hose in, these little entities, these little aliens, or whatever they were, uh, to retrieve water from the lake. And then you have the case in the mid-50s in California, a couple of miners, John Q. Black and his partner, they, uh, they had seen a, a craft flying overhead at times, just kind of thought, well, maybe it's some kind of military thing. They didn't think much about it. They had a job to do. And then one day, uh, John Black is in the woods. He sees what he thinks is a kid fishing over a stream, gets closer. It's not a kid fishing over a stream. It's some kind of an entity retrieving water in a bucket. He's wearing green trousers and has a tie on. Again, the, the, the connection between the fairy faith and modern day UFO experiences. And he sees this little guy take the water, go outside the woods, and climb a ladder up into his craft and take off. Very hard to know how to put context to put these in. And then when we look at other kinds of parallels, uh, 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 stoppages, uh, think, uh, things, vehicle stoppages, for example. In 1960, Dorothy Strong was in a taxi cab in North Cumberland, England. All of a sudden, the taxi cab stalls. And what's happening is they're seeing a phantom army manifest, which is not uh, terribly uncommon in England and even Gettysburg and so forth. Phantom soldiers, phantom platoons, and so forth. And as this army marches toward them, it kind of fades out. But the taxi cab is stalled, the fare meter goes crazy, and the, uh, they feel like they're being hit by a force field. The army dissipates, and everything goes back to normal. And uh, by the way, they uh, knew it was the Battle of Otterburn from 1388 because this had manifested many times before and they could see the, the type of uniforms they were wearing. Uh, car stoppages in UFO lore are, are very common. There's dozens and dozens of them, many, many cases. But here's my favorite vehicle stoppage of all time. Elliot O'Donnell was pretty much a paranormal investigator that wrote in the late 1800s and early 1900s, several books, fascinating books. And in Ghostland, he talks about his uncle by marriage. He identifies as Mr. B. Now, Mr. B is being driven by his servant named Dunkley. 
Now you know it's gonna be a true story if you have a servant named Dunkley, right? So it's at night, they're going toward Limerick, Ireland. Uh, everything's quiet, and all of a sudden, the horse stops dead. Mr. B turns around, sees the horse is frozen stiff and is sweating. He looks at Dunkley, who has a look of terror on his face, and he's in kind of a stupor, he can't seem to function. Also, Mr. B looks down around the parameter of the cart, and he sees his little shadowy forms moving around, but he can't make out what they are. He grabs the reins, breaks the spell, and they take off. Eventually, Dunkley comes out of it, and he asks him what he saw. Now, to Dunkley's mind's eye, he saw a troop of dancing fairies, and apparently when you come up upon the fairies making merry, that's bad news, they don't like it. He saw them looking at him, looking angry, climbing on the cart and trying to pull him off. Interesting that you had two people sharing the same experience, of course, if it's a true story. But they're seeing it in a very different way. Well, that's, that parallel occurs over and over again in the paranormal. Sometimes one person is completely unconscious and can't be awakened. Uh, sometimes uh, somebody is uh, completely conscious and experiences the full uh, event. Um, there's also uh, uh, just a little segue here. Um, the classic case of Betty and Barney Hill, we don't have time to go through all that, but how many are familiar with the Betty and Barney Hill case, 1961? A classic abduction case, they had missing time. It was retrieved by Dr. Benjamin Simon and very, very credible people. There's one kind of an interesting thing that happened during that incident, and it was uh, kind of, uh, sort of like an old fairy trick dusted off for the modern day. Betty was told she saw this book when she was on board talking to the leader, and it, was, it had strange photographs and writing in it, and she thought if she could have this, she would uh, be able to prove her story. Well, if we go back to the fairy legends and so forth, there are numerous tales of somebody in fairyland, whether they went there voluntarily or not, trying to retrieve something like gold or a jewel or whatever, and perhaps they get caught before they get out, or maybe they get out and the, the, the treasure turns into a spider or disappears. Well, as they're about to leave Benny and Barney Hill, uh, they're about to cross the threshold of the craft, the leader comes to her and says, I'm sorry, you can't have the book, the others object. You just can't get those treasures out of fairyland. Very similar to that old tradition. Now, when we get into crop circles is a, is a very, very uh, complex area, so we can just touch on it briefly. Uh, they started to show up in mass in the, the very complex ones in the early 1980s. Uh, I think it was Cheesefoot Head, England, was one of the first uh, that got to be a little more, I think it was only about three circles, is that right? Yeah. Um, but they got more and more complex as time went on, and of course people thought, well, these are aliens contacting us somehow, sending us uh, uh, messages and, and the symbols and the, and the uh, wheat fields. Or maybe it's the military with some kind of a, a satellite or radar technology. Um, and then the, the gentleman Doug and Dave surfaced, and they were said, "Well, we've been making these things for a decade." And we, and then the, the news media uh, blamed all of them on them. But that's actually, actually silly. Uh, when you look at the, the whole thing objectively, there's a, again, it's very complex. Uh, Linda Moulton Howe wrote a book on, on crop circles, and uh, a, a Dutch man, a D Dutch boy actually, uh, Robert Hoven, uh, he saw a mysterious light. Uh, hover over its property, it gave off electrical discharges, a 30-foot circuit was formed without this thing touching down. Um, many, there's many cases like this. Uh, Uruguay, 1977 in February, Angel Tona saw an orange light that was kind of Saturn-shaped over his cattle farm. Beams of light came down from this, formed a 10-foot circle. The animals responded to the energy or whatever it was. He had a power failure. He developed a skin rash. So it was all uh, very much what we call a close encounter of the second kind, where there was physical evidence. Um, these things go back a long ways. Uh, 1935, Paul Germany, Essex, England. He actually saw a circle form in front of his eyes, just a, a sort of a twist in the ground. In fact, they called them devil twists, but there was no apparent whirlwind or weather that called it. And it was just a common occurrence. Uh, uh, not often, but it did happen. Um, 
in a book called Opening Minds by Dr. Simeon Hine. He, uh, that's uh, about 2002 or three, I think that was. He started talking about how there are many people that get together, they, they meditate and so forth, and then they would go out and form some of these very complex circles that a lot of people thought must have been made by E.T. because it didn't seem like people could, could do these uh, under cover of darkness and be so precise. But he also found out, now the, the one called the Avbury Cube in 1999, March 1999, it was actually commissioned by the London Daily Mail by a group of circle makers. They wanted to prove that people could be fooled. So one night they made this complex uh, uh, formation and it did fool some people. Some people were nearby, they thought it was uh, ET and so forth, but it was not. But it turned out when they interviewed the people that made it, they saw light ball phenomena form while they were doing it. And they had also had this happen before. So you have situations where people get together, they create these designs, and some kind of paranormal phenomena comes up afterwards as if to say, perhaps, but wait a minute, this is our job, we're supposed to be doing this because the, the light phenomena is associated with creating them also. It seems to go two ways. This, uh, this light ball phenomena is, uh, 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 is seen in conjunction with crop circles uh, seemingly creating and also as a result of. Um, now we know a lot about uh, the claims of equipment failure in modern day crop circles. You've heard people say that their EMF meters uh, uh, went crazy or their, their circuits and their cameras burned out. Um, and some people say their energy drained from their bodies when they went in. They really felt uh, uh, completely sad. And again, there's a history of this. this. Uh, 1927, Roger Sear, Wiltshire, uh, he was calling them witch rings back then, so they've always had a different nomenclature. Uh, he went into one of these that he did not see it form, but his compass reacted to it, pointed to it. His dog would not enter it, even though he called him into it. He put his knife blade into the soil, and it magnetized it. So there is something, uh, you know, even though some of these are hoaxes, there is something real. Uh, some, some of this phenomena is actually real. And then we get into the, to get even more complex, we have the phenomena we call saucer nests. Now this is something you can almost wrap your head around. Uh, George Pedley, Queensland, Australia. This is in the mid 60s. Uh, he, uh, he sees the craft in the distance land in a lagoon. The next day he goes and checks it out and sure enough there's this circular depressed area. There were about five of these in this general area, but not in a formation together. They're just kind of separate. Um, there even was one off, if you know where George's Creek Road is, north of Gallipolis, Ohio, during the Mothman sightings, there was one form there as well. And again, we, this, this has a long history. Now, there's a, a woodcut pamphlet and from uh, 1678 called The Mowing Devil. You see this little demon with his sickle uh, carving a circle. Now, we don't know if this is actually supposed to represent a real occurrence or not, but it's creepy as hell, and so we, uh, we included it. Um, now, when we talk about fairy rings, there is a naturally occurring process that creates the circle of mushrooms, has to do with the fungus killing the grass and so forth. But it's interesting that these have always been associated with the fairies, with the little people. Um, in the uh, secret history of crop circles, uh, it, it, now some of these tales go way back and could be very fanciful and may, you know, we may not have the actual event. But a Mr. Hart in the 17th century said he was attacked by the little people, by the fairies, in a crop circle. He heard a strange humming noise. Uh, the humming noises are also uh, associated with the orbs people see, anywhere from uh, uh, baseball size to basketball size uh, over these crop circles. Uh, in, a, in a book called Transactions of the Essex Field Club from 1884, it's interesting, they talk about, uh, they have a section on fairy rings. Now they talk about the naturally occurring ones with the, the mushroom circle, but they also talk about something that sounds very much like a saucer nest or a modern day crop circle. They don't make any differentiation between either one. So this phenomena, whatever was causing it, has been around a long time. Evans Wentz, again, the, uh, the gentleman that wrote the Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, he talked to a Scottish minister that told him that when he was a lad, 
an old woman pulled him out of a fairy ring to prevent him from being abducted by the fairies. Uh, in Sweden, the same phenomena, the circular phenomena, the pressed down grass, they call them elf dance. And uh, Swedish elves are described as having large heads and elongated arms. I wonder if they also have a grayish pallor. Joey? So you go on vacation with your wife 10 years ago to a place you don't really want to go to because the Mothman Prophecies movie was pretty good, but who wants to see a museum about something called a Mothman? But my wife was very persistent, and it led to this point right now, and the tribute to Rosemary yesterday. So <clears throat> what had happened was, Rosemary was on Steve to write a book for a really long time, and a lot of his close friends are here, and we've all been on Steve for a long time to write a book, because as you can see, his knowledge is absolutely encyclopedic. Um, he knows these 10,000 pages of cases by heart. So Rosemary said, okay, well you and Tanya just did this book where you've laid out this new paradigm for paranormal research. Maybe we can create a partnership here. Because how do you evaluate these tens of thousands of pages of cases? So parallels, and patterns. I come from a very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, world where I marry history, uh, storytelling, all these different things together. So my mind naturally goes that way. So my job in the second half of this hour here is to kind of tell you what are we doing that's maybe new or different or with a different um, weighting system to sort through all this material because a lot of what Steve was talking about is anecdotal evidence. And a lot of it is from hundreds of years ago where we have woodcuts, we don't have photographs. Um, we have conversations about, you know, has this photo been retouched? And you know in the age of the internet and everybody has Adobe Photoshop and now on their phones they have very sophisticated photo editing software, that's the conversation. So when we're going back hundreds of years, how can we, assess these kinds of things. So that's really what we're focusing on in our work now, Steve and I, which really hand and glove with what Tanya and I are doing. So a couple of statements to get started. Um, I made a decision when we did watch out for the hallway, um, some people said, okay, I don't think your sh conclusions were strong enough. Um, and that's because we simply don't know and we're wise enough to know that we don't know and these things are many different things. But I said to Steve, at the risk of putting off some people, let's take a little stronger stance here. So here's a couple of statements. Given the growing amount of cumulative scientific anecdotal evidence available in the 21st century, it is absurd that there's still so much doubt about the legitimacy of paranormal phenomena. What do you think about that? It's time to stop saying, is this stuff real? Yes, it's real. What is it? Our book in progress is a response to antiquated and counterproductive positions of entrenched gatekeepers who want to keep science, history, and consciousness traditional, explainable, and controllable. Think about it. There's been hundreds of years of these very traditional explanations for things, and it's time maybe to move past those. So why parallels and patterns? Simply because we notice that cryptid sightings are often paired with UFO sightings, hauntings with cryptic sightings, psychological and physical impairment and paralysis pair with any of these things, and more often than one would think, one person's alien is another person's fairy. And I'm gonna to get to that. So when we created our investigatory team, which we call Roads Beyond the Known, you'll notice that the iconography includes all of these different kinds of things that's important to us. It also happens it overlaps with religion, with folklore, with quantum physics, with UFO sightings, cryptids, and hauntings. Well, how do you take all of that stuff and put these 10,000 pages of cases into all of that? Well, we've come up with a toolbox that we think is important. First of all, <clears throat> people talk about skepticism all the time. I think that skepticism has been misdefined. And oftentimes what they're talking about is cynicism. And we all know cynics, right? How, you probably all know someone when you said, I'm going to the Mothman Festival, and they said, oh, why would you waste your time with that stuff? 
They're cynics. No matter what evidence you present them with, what stories you tell them, they're not going to allow this stuff into their zeitgeist, into their worldview. Um, on the other end of the spectrum from cynics, and Tanya and I ran into a lot of these at the Webb Memorial Library, where we investigated for two years, are the over-enthusiasts. Everything is a ghost touching them, everything is a demonic possession, and, and these folks really muddy the waters as well. So we want to be skeptics. We want to go in with a healthy doubt about what is going on because a lot of our work as paranormal researchers that they don't show on television is the hours that it takes to sift through the data and to do it responsibly. So for us, 95% of the time, we're finding mundane explanations for things and letting people down. So now that Tanya and I are going into the field more and more and investigating this stuff, you're letting people down in a way, but that's your responsibility as an investigator, so so be it. So as Tanya says, your body is the best equipment that you have. You know there's all kinds of crazy equipment out there now. It looks very fancy, a lot of it's digital. Um, but Tanya, who's a psychic medium and who is a Reiki master and energy healer, um, has a whole book where she talks about the different things you can do, the way to ward yourself. A question that we get a lot when we're presenting is how do you protect yourself? How do you keep things from attaching to you? So you raise your energy field, you open up your sensing systems, but yet at the same time, you have to protect yourself. So that's a part of the work we do, but trust yourself. If you get a feeling, if you get those hackles coming up on your arms that I always forget the technical name for, um, if you think that you see something, if you think maybe you hear voices, be open enough, but then also be disciplined enough to say, no, 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 maybe it was something else. So our equipment kit is really kind of simple there. Um, it's just a digital recorder, a video recorder with some infrared, um, we also have uh, an SB11, that's that box right in the middle there, highly recommended rosemary, that's what she used, she recommended it to us, and we got a lot, a lot of communications at a couple of different locations, the Web Library, and now um, the Greene County Historical Museum in pa uh, Pennsylvania, which is one of our latest projects. Um, Tanya is very good with the dousing rods, so we use the dousing rods, that's a great tool, they're not very expensive, you can get them. Um, and calibrate them with yes and no answers, and then you can use those in your investigation. And you see down in front, we got batteries, lots and lots and lots of batteries, which comes in a little bit later. The next thing you need to do is to do your research. How many people here know that uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who created um, Sherlock Holmes, was also really the grandfather of paranormal research? Probably not a coincidence there. I'm also a Holmesiac and I write books about Holmes and plays. And uh, he is very, very, very skeptical about the paranormal. But Sir Arthur Conan Doyle did not have a great relationship with um, Sherlock Holmes. He really did. As a matter of fact, he killed him off, if you remember, and brought him back by popular demand because nobody would read his other stuff. Sherlock Holmes says, Dada, 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 I cannot make bricks without clay. So Steve provides truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of data, and we're also collecting it through our work too. So we do a lot of research. This is just some of the research that we did for the Web Memorial Library. We have notebooks. We spent hours and hours in the library, courthouses, doing different kinds of research and all of that kind of stuff. So a big part of this is the art and craft of interviewing. And we owe a lot you'll agree to John Keel, who famously said, ask them what they had for breakfast. Really get to know people. Find the larger parallels and patterns in their lives. If you listen to Steve's podcast, The High Strangeness Factor, and I highly recommend you do, he talks to several experiencers who, as he's talking to them into the interview, you find out that not only did they think that they were abducted or they saw a UFO, but they also had poltergeist phenomena. They had other kind of haunting in their lives. From the time they were little, they saw things or heard voices. So it's very, very important that we take an investigator's approach.
to be very, very thorough. When Tanya and I go into a home or into any kind of building where they invite us in to investigate, we usually spend at least two hours with them, sometimes the whole first session, just asking, taking a very, very, very detailed case history. Because you're also looking for anomalies. You're looking for inconsistencies. Um, that's the hard part of our job, but you also need to do that with a lot of respect. And Rosemary Ellen Guiley was a pro at that because she was an experiencer, like Tanya is, like I am. Um, when you've experienced this stuff yourself, you become uh, very sympathetic to people at the same time that you're, you're trying to make some decisions. So this is all about anecdotal evidence. And a, and a big thing in our field now is, is anecdotal evidence legitimate? Why? Because people have notoriously faulty memories, especially when they're under stress. If you talk to any police officer, they'll tell you that. Um, in a high stress situation, if they interview six people, there will be six subtly different stories. But this reminds us of Benny and Barney Hill. It also reminds us of a story that I'm gonna tell you about Tanya and I that brought us here from 10 years ago. So <clears throat> a question that I ask, I think it's a fundamental question if you wanna do this work, is the first thing you have to ask is, why would they lie? What is in it for people that come forward with stories? Now this gets a little more complicated in the day and age of television, reality television. Um, but in general, I remember being here, I'm guessing it was eight years ago, and one of the Mothman witnesses was here, and he said something very stunning. This had been decades, and he was a key witness. He said, I have made enough money on this story to pay my mortgage for one month. Also think about, if you know the story of the witnesses of the Mothman, Think about um, the mental breakdowns, the people who left town, the people who became recluses, whose marriages fell apart. Um, it's high, high risk stuff. So that's a question that I often ask myself. And then you have to watch, we were listening to Coast to Coast AM um, on, the, on the drive up here, and they were talking to an archbishop about the increase in exorcisms and people tr being trained um, for exorcisms. And mental illness, comes into it, and obviously we are not trained psychologists. Um, we had a case a couple months ago where we highly recommended that the people sought out some family therapy and things like that because it was complicating the haunting is really what was going on. So the Mothman, right, John Keel, this is, this is and, and, and all the witnesses are in there. This is the seminal work on this kind of stuff. So how do we set our standards as interviewers about who we should believe and who we shouldn't believe. Next week, Steve is presenting at the Van Meter Conference in Iowa. Uh, Chad Lewis, Kevin Nelson, and the third author did a tremendous job. Definitely read that book because they're very transdisciplinary. They come in from a lot of different places and a lot of different studies. But they, but the people that they talk about say, well, these were outstanding, upstanding citizens. It was the mayor of the town, and it was primary business people. We assign a lot of credibility to certain people. Some of those people are Lonnie Zamora because he was a police officer. Now, I, I absolutely believe Lonnie's story from New Mexico um, in the 1960s, Steve? Yeah. Right, or the guy who touched off the whole saucer thing and maybe named them Kenneth Arnold, who was a very successful businessman. He was a pilot. Pilots have a lot of credibility. Uh, men in uniform, not to be sexist, so people in uniform have a lot of credibility. But are they credible? You know, when you think about, you think about in your own town, your politicians and your leading business people, maybe the less credible people at all. So we have to think about all these things. Well, I'm a storyteller. So I look very carefully at character, plot details, all of that kind of stuff. Because a, a story, a true story, or even a story that someone believes is true, will have an inner coherence. So that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. Steve, when you evaluate these cases, you think about those things too. Are the people credit? Were they drinkers? Uh, you, you know, what, what are their motivations for doing this? So... As we're, as we're doing all this, I am a really firm believer in something called trans 
disciplinarity. And I'm just gonna give you, um, that's the Hollywood structure, forget that. Okay, so in the old days, and let's see if I can get this clicker to work, that would be outstanding. Okay, so in the old days, or in the PhD, academic higher education realm now, everybody's very disciplinary. Everybody's PhD is a thesis that's based on a very, very small thing. So that lasted for a long time. Then they started in the 70s and 80s talking about multidisciplinary, where you need to know some other things about some other things, but if you notice, they're still separated. Then they begin to overlap, sort of like a Venn di uh, diagram there, into interdi interdisciplinary. What we're trying to do is be transdisciplinary, to go, in order to work on this, you need to know the cases, and you need to know the paranormal field, and the different details, and all, you know, we had a ton of experts this weekend. But if you could get all those experts into a room for four or five days and start comparing notes, that's what Steve and I are trying to kind of start a movement towards, where this would be more collective. Um, Eleanor, the folklorist, had such great pieces of the puzzle that are so key to what's now going on with this stuff. Because when people are reading those new stories and the new formats for these for these former creatures and all of that, or the, that have been around, but in new paradigms, that's how they're manifesting for people in their homes, during hauntings, during possessions, all of that's changing. So the folklorists need to come in. Um, we have a member of our team who's an engineer, and that's great to find out why people get sick when they get exposed to a UFO or sometimes to a cryptid, what's going on there with the energy and all of that different kind of stuff. We're also looking at quantum physics. We're looking at neuroscience. Rosemary was really adamant for the book that we look at consciousness studies. There are leading, leading scientists now coming out, New York Times best-selling authors, who are saying that consciousness absolutely survives death. Now, Tanya and other psychic mediums will tell you that they know that because they communicate with them, they see them. If you were at the tribute yesterday, um, Rosemary came to Tanya and I before she died and then since she has died. So she was sort of experimenting with that line as she was going. So this becomes really, really important. So let's look at some of these things that Steve was talking about. I kind of come in and start looking at this. So you're probably familiar with Woody Derenberger's case. Susan Shepard used to come and talk about it for years. He saw Indrid Cold, which was this space traveler who landed in Parkersburg, not too, too far from here. And this is another instance of Italian looking, swarthy looking MIBs. This is sort of a classic look of that swarthy Italian looking MIB. Indrid Cold looks somewhat like that. This picture here was written, uh, drawn by a psychic medium who knew nothing about men in black and saw one of these things in the Webb Memorial Library that Tanya and I investigated for two years. He's vaguely got those same kind of features, which I think is really sort of interesting because he had no idea at all what, what men in black were. He was simply saying that they were there and we knew that there were spectral MIBs in the library from past experience. So. That is all very interesting. Steve, you had a guest on your show who was talking about the same thing in a Walmart parking lot. Um, there were these weird guys and then they came into the Walmart and there were these swarthy looking Italian, I'm a swarthy looking Italian, so I don't mind saying that at all. So, <clears throat> Steve was talking about the fact that Benny and Barney Hill saw these things in two very different ways. As a matter of fact, he, he didn't tell you, but um, they even saw one of the aliens in completely different ways. One, it had a nose like Jimmy Durante, and the other one had no nose at all. So in our work, Tanya and I get to talk to a lot of people, and, and that's what I'm, I'm really enjoying, um, rather than the investigation, but talking to people and collecting their case histories. And so we talked to an interesting woman in Ohio just a couple months ago. She told us a really interesting story. She comes from a family of psychic mediums, and one of the screenplays that I've written is about a family of psychic mediums. Um, Tanya's great-grandmother was an automatic writer, very powerful psychic medium. So these things tend to run, and there are tests being done now. Is it in the genes? Is it something about the DNA? What it is exactly that allows some families to have this psychic mediumship? So this, the whole family has it. 
She's going to visit her daughter and her grandchildren, and her grandson has been acting very strange in the house. As a matter of fact, every night before he goes to bed, he stands at the foot of the stairs and he says, okay, I'm coming up now, don't bother me. So grandma comes to visit and she winds up staying in the child's room. In the middle of the night, she wakes up and standing there is a classic gray staring her in the face. So the next morning, she goes down to breakfast and the little boy is there and she says, is there something in your room? Do you see something in your room? And he says, oh, you mean the fairy? That's pretty interesting. That really, a good part of Steve and I's book is about this overlap between UFO and fairy lore. Um, in the other part of my life, I'm writing an escape room for a cottage in Scotland. So I'm knee deep, well really eyeballs deep, in Scottish folklore. So this is just Scottish folklore. This is in books comparing these things like Passage to Magonia and books like that. And when they talk about fairy mounds and people being lifted up and carried, one guy was lifted up and taken from Scotland to Paris where he ha winds up with this silver cup that the king gives him and he brings it back. This is in the 1700s. When you read that stuff in isolation and they're talking about fairies, you say, wow, this really has a lot to do with UFOs. So the Phantom Army thing, I just want to tell you a little bit more. Um, I happen to be reading Plutarch's Lives. Synchronicity is a big part, I think, of all of this. And uh, in Plutarch's Lives, they talk about, now this is talking about Roman times, right? So this is, this is even, some of this is pre, you know, Jesus, pre-AD. They're talking about spectral visitations. They're talking about a soldier's arm that smelled inexplicably of rose oil. Um, if you're into hagiography, um, you know, the study of angels, that scent of oil, roses from wounds and things, that's a very interesting thing. They scrubbed his arm. Now, this is in a document about famous people. It's, it's in a chapter, I think, about Caesar, and they're talking about this detail. And also a swarm of bees around a flag, which is very interesting. Oh, it's in Brutus. So if you want to check it out, it's in the chapter on Brutus. The historian Josephus in AD 70 reported chariots and armed troops appearing over the temple of Jerusalem. That's in AD 70. That's very close to Dorothy... Strong. Yeah, and the Battle of Clontarf. So very, very interesting. All through the Middle Ages, if you know your religious imagery and all that kind of stuff, um, all through the Middle Ages, there are these weird, uh, they're not halos. They're not necessarily light balls. They look like UFOs, um, especially in pictures of Mary. And, and Mary is fascinating. Um, if you read Colin Wilson's Occult, there are pages and pages and pages of Mary stories. Um, also, R. Scott Rogo, his book about the universe, Hidden Universe, I think. Yeah, um, pages and pages of this stuff. At the Battle of Clontarf, April 23rd, 1014, fairies fought on the side of Cacullin, the, uh, the Irish chief. So that's interesting, too. Um, why does this happen? Why are these imprints at uh, Gettysburg? Tanya and, and my daughter went to Fort Macon, which is uh, outside Moorhead City in North Carolina, and saw several hauntings there. Why are there so many hauntings? Well, if you think about the fear, and you think about the violence, and you think about the intensity of emotion, it's like an iron being set on a piece of cloth. It makes an imprint. If you're religious Catholic, you believe in the Shroud of Turin, that pain, that suffering could have transferred something almost like a photo. Um, residual hauntings, which are like film, playing on a loop. Again, it's energy actually imprinting itself in the space. Emily, you guys were at um, Custer's Last Stand, that area there, and very powerful presences of armies. Very intense massacre and very intense and things that are building up. So that stuff all kind of happens. So where's that? There's the, here's a painting that I found of, of the chariots over the temple of Jerusalem there. Um, car stalls and all of that. What we're really looking at, and we're not scientists, but we're looking at the electromagnetic field. Oh, that's our daughter, Jolie. I'm gonna pass through some of this stuff pretty quickly. But we need to get to know this kind of thing. 
and get to know too, courtesy of Coast to Coast AM, about the 5G network and those one millimeter carrier waves and what they're capable of. Um, we're seeing a big uptick in really strange, I'm not willing to say that these things are demons and I was raised Catholic. I think demon is a label um, that is attached to a lot of religious stuff and it's hard when you're a scientist and investigator to invest a lot in that, but they are definitely dark entities. They're definitely dark, dangerous things and we're seeing a huge uptick in them coming through mirrors and different things like that. Um, so we need to know these things. Why does it give people conjunctivitis? Why does it make their eyes red? So having an engineer on the team is good to tell us this stuff. Because you can read about it in Valley, in Kiel, in Kelleher, in Strieber, these electromagnetic things. The compass is going crazy in um, fairy circles and all of that kind of stuff. Um, in at least one Pennsylvania Bigfoot encounter, if you saw Brian Seach yesterday, he's talking about the movement from flesh and blood to interdimensional. So in this case, and it's in Stan Gordon's book, Stan spoke here a lot in his Pennsylvania case book, the person reported going into a trance and being pulled toward the Bigfoot creature against their will. I said I had a picture here, there's a light in the I'm not sure what the picture was, I apologize. Okay, so I want to tell you a quick story and then and then I'm done. And it's a story that brought Tanya and I here because it has a lot of these elements in it. So like I said, we watched the Mothman prophecies. We moved to West Virginia and Tanya said, oh, only two and a half hours away is the Mothman Museum. We really should go see it. And I resisted it for 18 months. But we came to the town 10 years ago and we fell in love with it and we've been back countless times. Almost moved here so I could run this theater and the funding just didn't work out. So we absolutely love Point Pleasant. So we go out to the TNT area, and this is winter, of course, but it's still peaceful, it's tranquil, it's wonderful. Probably most of the people in here have been there. And it was really unsettling. That's what was bizarre. We felt like we were being watched the whole time, and we had talked to Bob, who used to run the point, and he had given us sage, and we had done this ritual, you know, we had a sweat lodge on our property, and kind of knew about these things, and yet, it was very unsettling. And then we went to the igloos, and we couldn't get very close to them at all. As a matter of fact, I got very nauseous, and some of the people in this room have been with me years ago. Since the explosion, when one of them blew up, the energy down there has changed very much. But especially between two and three, I could only get about a third of the way before I got really nauseous and dry heaved and because our bodies are strong sensing systems. And they, they get that EMF wave. They get that concentration of energy that's going down there. And so anyway, we leave after about 15 minutes. It's incredibly unsettling. And we're driving down 64 and we're talking about how weird. It's a beautiful sky. This looks like... Um, you know, this looks like Ducks Unlimited. It's absolutely gorgeous. And, and yet we're, we're just borderline frightened. And suddenly we see something in the road in front of us, which we probably would have ignored and we wouldn't have been here, except we said, did you just see that? So not from me, and, and the more we tell this story, the weirder it seems to me. I said, don't tell me what you saw. Let's go find some place to eat after we go see the guy who gave us the map for the TNT, because he said, if you see anything, let us know, and we'll draw this thing. We go to Bob's at the point, and it's closed, which is weird. We figured that we lost anywhere between 45 minutes and upwards to an hour and a half of time. So this is a missing time situation. Also on the way back on 64, where we saw this thing, there were cornfields on either side of the road. We came to find out later when we came back that that was impossible. There's a cornfield on one side of the road, but on the other side of the road there's a house and it's been there for a long time, decades. I also saw a gas station from probably the 1970s on the right side of the road heading back into town. There is no such gas station there and no one that I've spoken to from the town, any research we've done, no one's ever found anything. So we had a distorted time, we had distorted space, we had distorted geography, we had a building that wasn't there. And um, so we went and talked to Bob and he put us in touch with John and Tim Frick. That was 10 years ago in November. Our sighting was 10 years ago this past August. They came down 
uh, Rosemary came down, that's when we met her, and we kind of recreated everything. Uh, the AE whatever power plant, I forget the third letter, but the power plant is in direct line with where that cornfield cuts through and where the house is. Rosemary's feeling was that there is a portal there, and that would explain this thing. So Tanya and I went to dinner and we drew this thing. Um, I think mine's on the left and hers is on the right. It's been 10 years now. Um, we see things very differently and we have different perspectives. Tanya felt almost like it moved like a deer. I explained it like it was a man in a wetsuit being shot out of a cannon. So two very different descriptions, but yet if you look at our pictures, we both drew the road, we both drew a little bit of the cornfield, and the thing itself is pretty similar. So this really set us on our path. I'm going to leave you with that, and thank you for your time.